looks like he's coming our way. Hopefully we can scare him away. Okay, lots going on today. A whole lot going on today. A whole lot going on of, of not so good things. I got a lot of friends' homes burning up. I got a, a bunch of other friends that are basically uh, have most of their their uh, sentimental stuff packed up and they're ready to just absolutely desert their home and watch it burn up. Very, very frustrating, especially when I am. I don't know what I am, about a 14 hour drive, travel one way to even get up there. I got a hold of him. Remember Shane? Do you guys remember Shane? My good friend Shane? He sat on that porch in his remote cabin. We talked about this topic we talked about. Well, he's sitting there on red alert, waiting to desert their beautiful home that they built from the bottom up, scratching up pennies when they could. And I texted him today saying, hey, man. I'll hook on my horse trailer and pin it in your direction if that can do anything. But he said they got they got themselves under control, which not much I can do. But what he did share with me was the uh, RCMP and the conservation officers, fishing game guys, are stopping people from going onto the Shushuap Lake to supply, to use their boats to supply gear to help people who stayed to fight to save their homes across the lake. They're stopping. Them. It's so frustrating. And I laugh in frustration. It's not even a laugh. I guess it's just my frustration reaction. But it's so frustrating to see, not only here in Canada, but United States and around the world, it's, it's almost, it's just very frustrating to see it's, there's almost like our ability to act as a community is being stripped away from us. Right? I get it. They possibly don't want people going into dangerous zones, don't want people doing that, don't want people doing that. But in the meantime, there's not enough of the people with badges on to save people's homes. I don't get it. I mean, we started off as a communities right in the very beginning. And then we used some of our people in our communities to uphold the law. And, and hopefully do what's right for our community. But now it's kind of in a somewhat, which just seems frustrating. It seems like in a weird way, it's been turned around and we're not allowed to do anything. No, 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 you're not a community anymore. It's us, we police you. We direct you, we tell you what you can or can't do, or where you go and where you can't go. We tell you also if you can help somebody or not. What's going on? That needs to be kicked to the curb. Anyway, you can see where my brain is right now with that topic. It's very frustrating. I do believe that we need to get back to community. That's all we have. I do believe that we are being prevented from having strong communities. I am firmly convinced of that. And we need to uh, counter that. Start small, even. Maybe start small in your small town, small communities, and have meetings. Have public meetings without anybody there to police it. Everybody get a chance to speak, tell the truth, learn from each other, and then grow it. <laughs> and then include the next community and grow it. Com combine with the next community, get a bigger hull and grow that community and everybody talk with each other and make decisions and do what's right. That's what I firmly believe is the answer to a lot of our grief today. Anyway, I'll bite my lip. I am being censored and a lot of you are being unsubscribed. And I'm not doing it, okay? I'm not, I'm not unsubscribing anybody. I'm not removing comments. I'm not doing anything to any of the, the, the crew that follows this channel. But I do know that the AI, whoever's been programming this shit show, has programmed it to look for keywords, which in turn um, prevents our videos of free, of free speech from reaching all of you. I can see it on my uh, creator's page. I can see it. And there's a pattern. Each time I talk about a topic that we're not supposed, we're not allowed to be talking about anymore, everything goes sharply downhill. They don't want us talking about things. 
So, Rumble, right? Rumble again? But nobody goes to Rumble. I mean, there's a handful of people in Rumble. Everybody says go to Rumble, but everybody stays here. <laughs> anyway, enough babbling. What am I going to do? I'm getting a lot of my stuff done. I'm getting ready to go solo. Solo hunting. Way up north, the middle of nowhere. And I ordered a I ordered. I did it. I ordered a camera. Put on my credit card. <laughs> I ordered it. And I got a camera that's going to zoom in and out. Night vision and daytime. It's going to stream all night and all day. And yes, I do have the correct power pack, I do believe. And yes, of course, I will be trying that out before I go. And I would imagine if I ever did run into any other hunters out there somewhere, it's going to look, it's going to look a little crazy with me packing a satellite dish and a battery system and a laptop and seeing if I can pull this off. I think it would be absolutely crazy to be able to take a lot of you people out there who either can't hunt anymore or want to go on a, a, a hunt in Canada but would never be able to and you want to see it go down you want to see how I hunt possibly and I think that would be so exciting to be able to pull that off and stream that and of course I'll explain what I'm doing and why I'm doing it as it goes but you imagine if I did pull off the ridiculous and well you know something's gonna happen guaranteed it always does something will happen Hopefully it'll be a huge, great big bull elk coming into view in front of that camera. And I'll possibly be able to call them in and harvest them and show you how I do it. I think that's going to be really cool. And then once I get back from there, then we will take the whole setup remote on Vancouver Island and leave it there. So that we can possibly stream live 24-7 this huge riverbed where there's monstrous elk. Possibly wolves, black bears, possibly the odd cat or two and who knows what we're going to catch on that video right it's going to be something else and then i'll go back up north and go remote and do it again but anyways also i bought this tv here for streaming it's cheaper than real cheap i can't believe how cheap these things are but anyway i got to set up and i think somehow i haven't put too much thought into it i have other thoughts for that thing to be here for doing live and having people on here Instead of messing around with my phone. Maybe that'll help me out. <laughs> we'll see. But I have some friends who are going to come over and help me set up everything anyway. Now, what do we got here today? <clears throat> Alright, forgot to turn on the light. Get rid of the shadows. I'm going to become a professional lighting person. Videographer, editor, and commentator. <laughs> soon, aren't I? Now, we got some important voices to be heard but first please if you have any in you send out some good thoughts and prayers to all the people who are being affected by these fires that are wiping out communities and as well all the innocent people being affected by war send out a just throw down prayers for all those people combined they're both in infernos now, who do we got? What do we got? Let's get some voices heard. It's one thing I can do. I can make sure people's voices are heard. And that's what I'm going to do today. Alright. Who do we got? Listen to this. The title of this is Red. This is titled, Two Memories, 25 Years Apart and Only 200 Yards From Each Other. First, please refer to me as Ted if you decide to share my encounters. Thank you for that. I've been an avid fourth generation outdoorsman my entire life and I've always wanted to share my story with someone like you, an avid outdoorsman. At the time of this encounter, I was 10 years old. I was squirrel hunting in August with my 410 shotgun, that was my great grandfather, grandfather's, on a piece of wildlife management area property, WMA. I had hiked and hunted in those woods on my own and with my grandfather for years before I still use before and I still use those woods after my experiences, but I have never been in those woods without reminiscing that memory so long ago. Without a doubt. It was around noon and I was on my second trip to the woods to the woods of the day. I just shot a gray squirrel with my single shot 410. I went to pick it up, and upon picking up the dead squirrel, I turned around and noticed something walking towards me. Not a word was exchanged, 
and all I did was raise up my squirrel to show this thing my harvest. The reaction this thing did was to open its mouth and showcase its teeth. The teeth were extremely wide and oversized. I never said a word. And then this thing walked off through the timber. The entire encounter lasted about two minutes. Two minutes is a long time. Time it. If you're curious why I say that, picture something like this standing in front of you. Now look at your, your watch and, and go on two minutes long. That's forever. This thing was about five feet tall, very thick, had matted hair covering itself. The head was pointed with a gradual slope, no smell at all. Dark facial skin with sunken eyes. And lastly, this thing was calm and I never, and I never felt threatened at all. I told my grandpa and my dad about my experience and they deducted that it was an older African American with odd camouflage. Fast forward 25 years or so, I was bow hunting 250 yards from the squirrel ridge I had my encounter, and the second strangest thing happened to me. It was about 15 minutes to sundown, and I could hear something walking through the dried corn rows, and then a gust of wind blew me, sorry, blew from me to the cornfield where the noise was coming from. Immediately, at 40 yards, whatever it was stopped in its tracks. At that moment, I felt like something was looking right at me, and my nerves spiked. There was no movement or sounds for almost 10 seconds, which seemed like an eternity. And then all of a sudden, something ran off with such force, violence, and speed, I was immediately concerned. I stayed in the tree stand until dark and then walked back to my grandparents' house, which is about a mile total. The entire time walking back in the dark, I had a feeling that I was being followed slash stalked. I've been in those woods hundreds of times since, and not one thing happened I could not explain. These two moments in my life are very curious to say the least. I continue my journey for answers, and in my quest I have found similar stories and descriptions to my experiences, which makes me feel better. I do believe what I saw was something I have never seen since but with all my heart and honor, I believe I was supposed to have had that experience. Lastly, thank you for taking your time to allow people like me to share my story with. A.K.A. Ted. Got you, man. I appreciate you coming forward. Ted. <laughs> You're a brave free man. Brave free man. There's a lot. There's a lot of brave free people here. A lot. Love it. I love it. This is a title, please share. All right. So I thought I sent this email to you before, but I must have sent it to the wrong email. I don't know. But the story I'm about to send you was originally sent to the blah, 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 oh, money taker. Basically told me I was a liar. And then only him and his organizations know what real Sasquatches look like and how to find them. And believe me, I wasn't looking for them. That other dude on the show also seen the story and was genuinely intrigued, and he said he believed me. Money Taker, on the other hand, not so much. Money Taker also told me there was no way I saw Bigfoot because they aren't in that part of Ohio. I'm glad to see someone exposing the fraud they really are. So here's my story. Hopefully share it with the world. This sounds familiar, but we've had a lot of people start off like that. This might be a, This might be another... Repeat, you never know. It's not too long. I want to share my story with you on my first and only encounter. That's hunting coyotes on a new property for a landowner in a town just outside Marietta, Ohio. I found a dried up beaver dam in the bottom of a holler. I found lots of sign, so I decided to go back the next morning. So about an hour before daylight, I snuck down into that bottom and sat up waiting for daylight to start calling. The beaver dam was about 200 yards to my right. Right at daylight, something coming off the hillside towards the dam. It was big and dark in color, but I couldn't make out what it was. I'd read reports of bears starting to venture into the area, so I, so I thought that might be what it was. Once it broke the clearing, then I knew it was not a bear. The massive creature broke the clearing and was walking around the edge of the dam, picking up stuff off the ground. 
I couldn't tell what it was grabbing, but it would walk a few feet, stop, and pick something off the ground, and just continue to do it. I watched this creature for what felt like an eternity, but it was only about two or three minutes before it either caught my wind or felt my presence. Either way, it knew I was there. It made a break for the trees, head back up the hill into the briar thicket where it had come from. Thinking back on it now, I should have tried to film it, but I was froze. I couldn't move my body. I knew what I was looking at, even though I couldn't believe it. I was so scared to move, not knowing what it would do or how it would react. I was only 20 years old when that encounter happened, and I haven't returned to the property since then. That has been roughly seven years ago. I never told that story before due to being scared of being ridiculed. That was the email I sent to the BF website. I started watching your videos and realized I'm not alone in these sightings, and I would be honored if you shared this with everyone. Thanks for reading, Steve, and keep exposing the haters. Sincerely, Drew. Gotcha, Drew. I think I read it before, buddy, but there's no harm in reading that one again. And we'll never stop. Now, let's hope that this is brand new. See how frustrating this has been since I had my phone wiped? So frustrating. But at least I still have every single email. It's just, it's going to be a, a bit, of, bit of a challenge sometimes not to double up, right? But it's harmless. This is titled Filming Bigfoot. Hello, Steve. I watch your channel almost every day. I haven't had an experience with the Sabe. I have had an encounter with aliens and a face-to-face -face encounter. But I know your channel is not for any cheese, etc. But on the subject of filming or taking pictures of Bigfoot, survey, etc., the best bet, obviously, is going to the Patterson-Gimlin film. You can use the same camera that he used. I don't know how you would rig it to capture pictures like a trail camera, but obviously that film has been proven as authentic. That, to me, is the simplest and most obvious solution to filming the Sabe. If it has been done once, it can be duplicated. I remember the very first trail cameras that came out involved just a string, and it only took one picture. My cousin and I were avid white-tailed deer hunters, and I remember him being very enthusiastic about purchasing several of these trail cameras and post them on our property where we deer hunted. This is the same hunting property that the encounter that we encountered the ET in 1974. By the way, by the way, I don't care if you use my name. Russell Wilkins, Woodstock, Georgia. You know what, Russell? Send it to me, man. Send it to me. You sound you sound pretty authentic. Uh send it to me. I want to hear what you ran into, especially if it's in the woods. I want to hear. Alright? And yeah, uh, the trail camera thing, I was amazed. I I was very, very avid hunter way before uh, trail cameras came out, and even I can remember when VHS tapes of hunting shows, hunting was recorded and put in VHS tapes, and you could rent them from a hunting store. I remember being absolutely freaked out. We could actually watch guys hunting for real and shooting game. It's like, what? No way. This is crazy. I rented every single one of them. <laughs> now it's so mainstream, it's like yawn almost, right? I guess I'm getting older. I guess. I don't feel it, though. This is titled Encounters. Steve, just a note for a quick question. This is Santa Ron Hi, Phil. Use my name if you wish. I'm 73 years old and I've told my experience to everybody that cared to listen to it. Although sometimes I'm pretty sure they don't believe it and I don't really care. I'm too old to care. I wrote you a couple years ago about a Sasquatch that saved my father from a bear. Now the question. Have you ever noticed that pretty much everybody who's sorry to share the encounters might be random, but have you ever noticed it when there's one, there's more than one by the same individual? For the first time, I'm beginning to believe that if they want you to see them, you will. And by the same token, if they don't, you won't. Steve, your time is valuable and very much appreciated by the audience. All right, man. Appreciate you, Santa. Ron? Yeah, it's, it's very, very obvious that people who have seen these beings see them more than once in their lifetime. And now, what does that have to do? Does that have to do with being tagged like some people claim to be or the claim they can do is tag us? Or 
Is it because a lot of us are living on a different vibration, energy vibration? I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen these beings, twice for sure, maybe three times. And I don't know, what do I do? I probably have at least three, two or three experiences a year with things being tossed at me or noises or whatever, right? Finding tracks. Seeing bright lights. Okay, next. Dog Man Encounter. I haven't had one of these for a while. Hey Steve, my name is Luke Nunn. I've been listening to you for about four years now. In 2014, I had a dog man encounter in rural southwest Virginia. Me and my ex were riding back roads in a 1998 Ford Taurus with our dog. A 130 pound Mastiff Rottweiler mix as we did almost every evening just to relax. We headed back to the house and rounded a curve. There was also a knoll. When it popped over the knoll, I hit something that was standing in the road. It flung through the air about 10 yards. I was going about 40 miles per hour when I hit it. It hit the ground and slid five more yards. It sat up with its arms down by its side like a human and it howled slash screamed the longest, loudest, most disturbing sound that I've ever heard in my life. I felt it in my bones. It sounded like a large man screaming his brains out with a giant wolf howl overlapping it. At this point, my mind is trying to place what that is that I just hit. Initially, I thought, massive coyote? I had a single barrel 12 gauge with a 3 inch double odd buckshot shell in it in my back floorboard. I reached to get it and the thing stood up on all fours and started walking towards my car. <laughs> like the movie Terminator, right? Eh? I was instantly froze. It was staring directly, 100% into my soul. I had my bright lights on it as it was around 10 p.m. It somehow knew where I was inside my car with the high beams on and locked eyes with me as it walked closer. I thought, that was not my own. Uh, oh, sorry, a thought that was not my own came into my head saying, quote, stay in the car or you're going to die, as if it knew I was thinking about shooting it. I literally couldn't move. I just stared back into his huge, glowing, amber eyes. It walked up to the car and right up against the passenger side and disappeared into the woods beside the road. Its head was higher than the roof of my car with it on all fours. It had to lean down to stare into the car. It had a huge, ripped, bodybuilder torso, long muscular arms and raccoon-like hands and narrowed at the back hips it had a mane like a lion kind of patchy fur colored like a coyote its eyes were the most disturbing part to me its snout was abnormally long and arced down it looked exactly like a werewolf in the movie dog soldiers just way more haggard and demonic it radiated an evil feeling and i could feel the hate from its eyes my 130 pound mastiff was cowering in the back floorboard, shaking and whimpering. It never stood up on its back legs, but I did just hit it with a car, and it appeared very old. But if it had stood up, I'd say it would have been a good 7 feet tall, and had to be three to 400 pounds. I've lived on a 300 acre farm for 33 years. I'm pretty familiar with animal sizes and weights. I've also been camping in the Blue Ridge Mountains and heard Sabe walking around the tent, whooping and hollering and making owl noises. One time they left us a cool stick that was shaved down with no bark on it, right outside the tent door. No smells, no fear, just heard and felt the presence. I've also had deer eyes shot and watched lay there until dark and then go get the truck and come back to get the deer and there's just a bloody spot on the ground where the deer was. Could have been anything, I guess. But it seems like if it was a big cat or a coyote pack, they would have left a mess or a trail. And yet none of that was there. Thanks for what you do, Steve. You're a good man. Whoa. 
That's pretty heavy duty, man. That's something that I, it, it is just a tough, is still, I'll admit it. I accept it. I accept these experiences of these um, human canine cross things. But it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to accept. It's very disturbing. A pattern that is with these being sightings that is common with the Sasquatch being sighting is the mind speak. That's common. The raccoon like hands, that's a pattern, without a doubt. The arced muzzle, I think that's new for me. Arced muzzle. The mane like a lion, we've heard that numerous times. The color, the color of a coyote, heard that numerous times. The amber eyes, we've heard that thousands of times. Anger and hatred, we've heard that thousands of times from all of these extremely odd beings being reported. Now listen, now, here, now here's where my brain goes. I like to think common sense and I like to think I, can, I have common sense and I think rationally. And I read, I figure out, I've been figuring out game animals for a long time. I've had to figure out humans for a long time. It's self-preservation since I was a kid, right? I like to think that I'm fairly good at it. Now, when anything, I don't care who it is or what it is, when something, when, let's just say humans, when humans verbally tell you not to do something, they don't want you to do something or else, they're telling you that that action scares them, or they're telling you that, that action that you may be thinking about doing will hurt them. That's the only reason. Because if that action they're warning you about does not harm them in any way, they're not going to give you a warning to not do it. Right? If a 12 gauge with slugs could not hurt me, and I knew somebody in front of me was apparently about to get one out and start dummying me with it, I would give a flying shit. I'd probably be more like, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Take a whole bunch of shots at me. Let's see what you can do. That's what I'd probably do if the 12 gauge couldn't affect me. Right? But if I was possibly wanting to be intimidating, stay in control of the situation, and not get shot, I'm probably going to pull my strongest wild card, which would be at my disposable at that moment, which would be, I'm going to get in this guy's head right now and block him before he gets that 12 gauge out. Right? Do you think that makes sense? So is it possible that being is letting him know? in a subtle, in a different kind of way. It's like bullies. Bullies always tell you that they're scared, right? All bullies, bullies scream out loud they're scared. Every single one of them screams out loud they're scared. Just by acting big and tough and menacing all the time. They're only doing it because they're scared shitless. So, you got this thing that looks like a part canine built like a shredded bodybuilder. Full of hate. Why is it threatening the man to not get out of the vehicle with the weapon. Why? Obviously because you and the weapon could probably do some serious damage to that being. I'm right now I'm willing I'm willing to bet large on that. Large. Because that being is not going to instantly try to intimidate the living shit out of you to not do it. He did say stay in the car, you're gonna die. Well, he knows, he knows if he gets out of the car, he's bringing that piece out with him, putting a hole in it, right? I don't know. What do you guys think? Throw it down in the comment section below. Do you think I'm right? Picture being the big, ugly bully. Bulletproof. Existing on a different plane, even, possibly. Why would you even waste your time threatening a human to not get out of a vehicle? Who gives a shit? He can't hurt you anyway. Who cares? Do whatever you want. Climb out of the vehicle, jump up and down on it, shoot your gun at me 50 times, do whatever you want. I don't care. You're not going to do anything to me. Right? I wouldn't waste my time threatening somebody. Anyway, there's me looking into the dogman thing a little deeper, right? Trying to make sense of this crazy shit show that's going on. Alright. Another one. Let's listen to this. Thanks for writing that in, man. If you've learned anything about those beings, any more since you originally sent that, send me more. Send me what you have. 
All right, send me some more people who have seen one of these things, spent time around them, whatever. If you know more, send it over, and I'll share it. All right, <clears throat> this is the title of my story. This is like 2020, April of 2020. Hello, Steve, love your channel, what you do to help others. My story isn't dramatic and exciting, but they can't all be earth-shattering, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not a prerequisite. It does not matter. We do not look for any flavor. All we look for is all the honest people. That's all we're after. Get them here. Get everybody here. We got you here. So let's listen to you. I live in rural Pennsylvania, in the middle of nowhere, really. I grew up spending days and nights on my grandmother's small farm. As dusk came, anyone who was visiting the farm would pile onto the porch and swap stories, or just listen to the sounds of nature all around us. If there were only a few of us, we would sit quietly and watch as white-tailed deer made their way out of the forest and into the field below the house. Sometimes they came quite close before someone made a noise and they went bounding away into the tree line. I tell you these things to explain that I'm not a stranger to the wildlife around me. I had a bear on my front porch when I was a small child. I was not scared. Nothing in the woods scared me. Until 2009. It was November and my grandmother had just passed away. As usual, funerals were like little reunions as family members came from far and wide. It was like old times, walking the paths and fields around the farm in the chilly air with my cousins, all of us now grown up. Night had fallen and we walked back to my grandmother's house to use the facilities. I stayed on the front porch alone and waited for the others. I was casually leaning on the porch railing, the only light, the glow from a TV just inside the window. And then I heard it. I know what deer sound like when they walk, or any four-footed creature for that matter, and this was on two feet. They were swishing rapidly through the leaves on the ground. My personality is such that I would have hidden and jumped at, out at whoever was approaching the porch, just to scare the crap out of them for a laugh. I was not in a playful mood, however, as a feeling of terror came over me. It has haunted me since that night. Why was I terrified? I cannot explain it. I ran to the house and without stopping to think, I blurted out that Bigfoot was outside. To this day, everyone calls me the Bigfoot lady in mockery. I doubt it was a person because we know the neighbors well. And around here, you don't come into someone's property at night without announcing yourself unless you want a shotgun fired in your direction. It wasn't deer or a bear. I don't know what it was. It's not something memorable, except for that inexplicable terror. I'll never understand that. Listening to the stories you share and hearing the feelings of dread that come over people when these damn things are near. I wonder if that's what I experienced. There are a few accounts of Bigfoot in the area, but it's rare to hear the stories because of the ridicule that follows those that follows telling those stories. I don't know if there's a Bigfoot, but I don't know that it wasn't. I'm a biologist slash forensic scientist. I'm trained to think logically and critically, but in an instant, I was brought to a panic level that I have not experienced before or since. It's okay if this isn't worthy for the channel, but telling the story in a safe space has helped. Thank you for all you do. Robin Schick. You can use my name if you need a story for a slow news day. No one around here knows what YouTube is. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> okay, Robin, appreciate you big time. Forensics. Be interesting to hear if you have had, um, if you have spoke with any of your colleagues from school or work about this topic and if you get shut down real quick or not. And I wonder what, if your views, I wonder, here's a question. Directly for you, Robin, if you're still here uh, with us, this is 2020, I hope you are. How about any of you, any of you who, who went through the education system, pursuing the sciences, biology, let me know if following, say this channel or even more, if listening to all these people has changed your attitude towards your previous education. I'm curious to know that from all of you, quote, academic, end quote, types, okay? I'm very, very curious to know if you regular followers of this channel who studied and graduated in the sciences, biology, whatever you have you, 
if all of the people here have had an effect on your attitude towards your previous education. How's that for a question? I'd love to hear your answer. Now, here's another one. I've had a lot of emails from this area. This may be uh, a double down, and if it is, oh, I've emailed him back in this. All right, do I'm allowed to share this? Let's see. Let's see. All right, I'm going to read this. More so because I'd like to read it again for myself because I am going right here in less than two weeks. Peace River Plain View Siding. Steve, I really appreciate the reply. Okay, so hold on a minute. All right, I read through this. I'm not sure if I shared this volley with you guys or not. Now, the original email, the original story was this fella and another guy were hunting elk basically right where I've hunted numerous times. They're in big timber, excuse me, and they could see the color of the elk, excuse me, patches of elk color moving below them. And all of a sudden, something like 30 yards right in front of below them was this great big hairy dude right there. And he said he had a scope, he looked at his buddy, said, do you see what I'm seeing? And his buddy said, yep, shoot it. Right, and he said the second he flicked his safety off, this thing, ex this, basically he said the forest exploded. This thing took off. And he didn't want his name shared, and I replied to him, and then he replied back to me. Now here's the reply. Now did I just lose it? Come on, where am I here? All right, here we go. It was originally called Peace River Plainview Siding. Steve, I really appreciate the reply. This whole thing boggles my mind. The problem is, once you've seen it, once you've seen, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. And I agree, it is a huge piss-off that all these things have been covered up. And if people don't think the government is actively working to hide this, they need to give their effing heads a shake. I don't, even, I don't even want to know how deep this rabbit hole goes. I guess when one of us eventually dumps one and hand delivers a severed head to the news station, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, not the Canadian news station, not today. They own it. Even if it, makes, even if it makes it that far. It's probably been attempted before. That's all that was going on through my head when I had, had my encounter. No one's ever going to believe if I don't have a body. I don't know, tens of thousands of people can see down near the same thing over and over again, and yet we're all crazy, and or uneffable white dudes. To which I really think Joe Rogan was only referring to the researchers on TV running around the forest whooping and banging on trees, which doesn't seem so far off. <laughs> You're bang on. I would be able to go back out without this somewhere in my mind. Unfortunately, I get the feeling that somehow or another, these things are aware if you have knowledge of them. Does that make any sense? Potentially, once you've seen one, once you're... Once, sorry. Potentially, once you've seen one once, you're way more likely to have another encounter? I have no idea. I've always been aware of that personal energy that we give off, especially evident around horses, as I'm sure you know all too well. You stay calm, your horse stays calm. You freak out and panic, or are real on edge and the horse follows suit. That is absolutely true. It works around cows like crazy too. In the bush, I've always just focused my mind on being neutral. Not excited, not panicky, not angry, or overly predatory. Not focused on killing, just calm and neutral. And it seems to have a noticeable effect on the wildlife around me. I'm pretty certain this must be connected to the creation of those hex suits. I'm sure you've heard of those. Either you know exactly what I'm talking about, or you'll think I'm off my rocker. I think it'll come naturally, but if or when I come across another one, I shall be sure to adopt your F right off mantra. Okay, quick note on the hex suit. Um, I don't watch 
I don't watch the hunting channels up here in Canada. I just don't. I'm not into it. But when I do ha have visited my friends in the States, they always have that channel on. The Outdoor Channel, OLN, or whatever it is. Whatever the channel is, the Outdoor Channel. And whoever come up with a hex suit has been marketing the shit out of it. And I would always laugh at it because the most of the most of the uh, advertising, most of the video clips they used to promote it were like turkeys coming right up to them. Well, that's all too easy. Getting real close to white-tailed deer, big deal. Honest to God, I had a five by five whitetail coming straight at me in snow camo in the middle of the trail with the sun behind me. And when he got too close to me, I managed to touch him on the front left shoulder with my gum boot. <laughs> and he, of course, he went 40 feet in the air and that honestly happened. So. The hex suit didn't do anything for me at the time. And as furthermore, I always thought if I could get a hold of the person who made the hex suits, I would say to them, okay, you come with me, and I'm gonna take you to where this grizzly bear and her three triplet this spring's cubs are feeding on a pile of dead moose. And you have to sneak up on them from upwind and let me videotape the whole, the whole, um, results, <laughs> right? But there is something to be said about your electromagnetic field, for sure. Is the hex suit eliminate that? I find it very hard to put money on that myself. That's just me. Okay, sorry for the interruption. That's what I had to say about the hex suit that you mentioned. Sneak up on a sow grizzly bear with cubs in a hex suit and you'll convince me. If you can't, no. Who's going to do it? I think I actually might have messaged that guy for the invite, too. <laughs> All right. I showed my buddy that was with me that day your video of our story. And after discussing it with him, I have a few more details you might find interesting regarding our, the encounter. It happened about three kilometers west of the Pine River, directly northeast from Chetwind. I'd give you the pin, but it sounds like they're all over the whole Chetwin slash Peace Country anyway. Yes, they are. After we saw whatever we saw, I'll leave out the name, Blank was really shaken up. And he told me he actually felt physically ill, like he was going to puke. When we got back to camp, we planned to go and hunt the other side of the pine for a day or two. Leave these elk alone to cool down for a minute and I ended up dropping the two others off to set up a spike camp. Due to some truck trouble, I decided to head back towards town and cell reception, but Blank was still feeling sick and nauseous, so he jumped in with me. It was starting to get dark, and we just managed to get one bar of service before the truck died. Bad alternator. And I called an old friend that lived just outside of town towards the mine. Great guy. Hopped in his truck and came out to rescue us. He had never met Blank before, but after watching us pull the alternator out, he said something along the lines of Blank looking like he'd seen a ghost. We got in his truck and began to embarrassingly recollect the day's events. He surprised us both by telling us he believed us wholeheartedly and assured us we saw the real deal that he had seen three over his life. Two in the Chetwin area, Apparently one frequented the area up the pipeline behind their house and one massive red-haired red -haired one on the island that made eye contact with him and roared so loud he almost shit his pants. Interesting turn of events that we end up hearing all this the very same day as our encounter. Yeah, it also just goes to show though if, if you do speak of this in a straight up manner with people it doesn't take long to find someone who has had an experience or knows somebody. It just doesn't, obviously. You just gotta do it, if you're interested in the topic. My younger brother, effing terrifying if you ask me, especially for an 18 year old guy with absolutely no knowledge of these things. He said I could share this with you, but didn't want it. Share it online. I don't doubt it for a second. I remember my uncle mentioning standing around the fire at camp with my old man wanting the last boy. Ah, damn it. Ah, damn it. I just read the whole long reply and he shared another story from somebody close to him who had another run in with one of these things. And right at the end of the story it says, He told me it's okay to share it with me, but not to share it online. <laughs> that sucks.
but oh well. So we'll go back to the rest of the paragraph after he shared what happened to this guy who's close to him after this guy ran into one of these things. But I will tell you that in the, the end of his experience was that he felt this being was absolute. The being gave off absolute terror and he said he sensed that it was absolutely evil. And he saw it in the dark in front of him. All right. I've hunted that area for the last 15 years, mostly on Horus, and I can't say I've had any encounters. And not that, I, not that I'd have a clue what was going on if I did. I've had a few funny feelings out there, and I've had horses that act up for no apparent reason, but who knows? It is what it is. And I'm certainly not one to make something out of nothing. Hopefully I can continue hunting out there without any uninvited visitors slash hairy efforts interrupting my hunt. I'm still in partial denial about this whole topic, and I feel like I need to know more, but I kind of just want to bury my head in the sand at the same time. I can't help but think the Sasquatch is just a tiny thread that, if pulled the right or wrong way, is going to unravel the blanket of our world as we know it. Ah, all the lights, aliens, orbs, and hairy Fs, I just want to hunt and enjoy my province. Keep on fighting the good fight. I appreciate it. What are you doing? More than I can properly convey. Cheers. Okay, man. All right, and then I got one last reply. I'll share it. I don't even know if I wrote it. Steve, thanks for the reply. Fair enough. I'm sure you're right. I've got many more questions, but I don't think you have the answers or the time. I wonder if you could make a video in the future regarding continuing to hunt and recreate in areas where these experiences have taken place. I don't want to feel scared or intimidated, but I can't help but think about these things when I'm deep back in the brush by myself. And I'm sure anyone that has had a similar experience has shared feelings. Hard to put it out of your mind completely and go about hunting the way I have before. Could you also touch on how you would react if you had an encounter with hunters while guiding. I'm not planning on stopping hunting anytime soon, but I certainly have a different mindset with a new thought in the back of my head. Hasn't stopped me yet, though. Decent little, decent little mealy from this past season. I guess send me a picture. I think I remember it, too. Could you also touch on how you would react if you had an encounter with hunters while guiding? I haven't had encounters with hunters while guiding. I think I have. I heard with another guide, we were in a, a drainage called Tensy Creek off the Racing River, last sheep hunt, late, freezing, freaking cold, and we were listening to tree knocks up the side of the mountain. I do remember that, a handful of tree knocks. And I think that's about it for guiding up north. I think, I do believe. I've had a couple of friends, um, they woke up to tree knocks. Um, halfway between Tetsa and Toshoe Lakes, in that country there. Huge, they said it was extremely loud, massively loud, alarming, knocking on trees, two different ones. Woke up to that. What else? Friend of mine saw what he thought was a moose run across the headlights in front of his truck at Muncho Lake, but he said the knees were bending the wrong way. For it to be the back end of a moose. Uh, what else? Fort Nelson, there's been tracks on the fort, on the banks of the river down there. Tons of sightings in the oil field above Fort Nelson. Well, you know the whole ordeal, right? All the way down to you, where you are, and around that area. One time I did, I will show this. I was hunting, I was by myself. I believe I was camped by myself as well. I was hunting, I was hunting way up that Jack Fish Lake Road, right? Cross the train tracks, keep going until you get past all the farm fields, keep going straight. Where it drops down to the river where a whole pile of people camp down there. And I was camped farther up from there. Actually, I was more above the piece. But I doubled back and I hunted farther up river. Went up this old road. And I, and didn't, I couldn't see any, there's nobody who was hunting around there. I could just see one old set of quad tracks, but no traffic. And I went hiking. I followed that road forever, heading heading west and then uh, and I, rem I remember it was being it was I saw one set of fresh bull moose tracks coming up out of the timber going down the road I blow some calls blah 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 and then I took a side road that went down deep into that timber and I was slowly walking along I'm gonna sneeze Excuse me.
and I was slowly walking down this road. And it was big, mature, poplar, and uh, spruce mixed timber on both sides of the road. I was going down, going down, and I could see there's swamp at the very bottom of this road, and there's a deactivated old road, no prints on it, no nothing. I could see swamp water crossing the road down the bottom. I remember thinking, okay, well, maybe I'll make my way down to the swamp because it looks like there's a bit of an opening to the right down there a little bit. I'll have a look around there. There was some old gravel berm pushed up on the right, and one of those old ponds, you know those ponds they make up in those roads? There's one of those, Was it turned out one of those was the opening on the right. And I got down there and I climbed up on that dirt shoulder, and I do remember, recalled that it was absolutely deathly quiet. I remember being a little on edge, but it's not hard to not be on edge, right? I mean, it's not hard to be on edge after you've seen one of these beings and you're hunting by yourself where they're seen by a lot of hunters, right? And why do I keep going to those places? Well, to be honest, it's pretty tough to go anywhere in BC and go hunting where these beings haven't been or aren't. It just is. So you either have to suck it up, take your chances, or quit, right? I'm not going to quit. So anyway, um, of course, the thought of these beings is always right there, like right there, right behind your ear the whole time, but you're concentrating on finding a big bull moose or a big bull elk, right? Because you want to get it done. You want to go hunting and you want to enjoy it and you want to hopefully keep it in your mind for whatever it might be out there to leave me alone. Anyways, I got down there, got up in that clay bank on the right and I'm looking around, looking for tracks, seeing if there might be much bull action going around, that mud that wasn't, there's a few animals, and I never forgot this, when I just turned around, I just caught something go ripping across the road. So I remember the road went back uphill. So on an angle though, like that, I just caught something. It was so fast and such a quick glimpse. All I can describe it was a blur of black. It was either a blur of black or a blur of dark, dark, dark chocolate brown and very low to the ground and went ripping across the road. And I remember thinking right away, it had to have been a wolf. It must have been a wolf. So I go booking it up there to see if I might catch in the timber. I didn't see nothing. I didn't see absolutely nothing. I didn't hear absolutely anything. I was already a little bit on edge anyways, feeling uneasy. But I'll never forget that. I will never why don't why is this why is that an episode that I'll never forget? Do you know how many times I've seen something rip across the road? Do you know what it was? Big deal. Thousands of times or across the trail. But that one time. That one time. Anyway, there you go. It's funny, I will freak myself out. Will I get anxiety and stress right now? It's probably the worst time for me when I'm about, and this is for all you hunters out there, all right? Hikers, campers. Like here I am, I'm getting my gear ready today, a lot of it, and getting my, a lot of my chores done around the farm before I go. And it's now, my worst anxiety and apprehensions is here. It's always here at home. And it's always at night when I go to bed. And that's when I will s somewhat let my thoughts drift to scaring myself. I don't know why. And I'll get, I'll get a little bit of anxiety, I'll feel apprehension, thinking, oh God, what am I doing? What am I doing? I always get it. I'll admit it. I always get it. What am I doing? I can't believe I'm doing this. Until I leave to go and I'm jacked and I can't wait to get in there and I can't wait to go after those elk. And my anxiety and my apprehension slowly dissolves as I get closer to going in to the point where I'm setting up camp. I can, I can feel the feelings I get right now as I'm setting up my camp alone, usually in the dark. And I sleep like a baby. I don't know why. I just think, about it. oh well, if you're out there, you're out there. Nothing I can do about it. I'm going to sleep. <laughs> I go to sleep and I get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I make my coffee, pack my shit on the quad or whatever I'm going to do. Hike. And uh, I carry on and I get into the woods in the pitch, pitch black. I always get in there at least an hour before seeing light. And I just sit there quietly in the darkness in all that bush around me and the trees around me with my coffee. And I sit there dead quiet, listening, hope, hope, hoping I'm going to hear that bull elk scream first without me making a sound. And I do it and I still do it. And I'm not sh sitting there terrified, wondering what's that or what's that. I'm just not there. I'm calm. I'm calm and into the hunt. And I am thinking about these beings, but not really that much. 
Not as much as I do when I'm at home. I don't know why. It's really weird, don't you think? Maybe some of the psychologists out there have some kind of an explanation for how that's working between my ears. I think my biggest thing, what I think about while I'm hunting is, because it's so much work, it's so much time away from home, it's a lot of money, is when I do score on my bull, I am thinking, I better not get it stolen. <laughs> I do I think that a lot, the Hindu bastards. Leave me alone. You guys get to hunt year-round, I don't. Don't be stealing my animal. I'm busting my ass for this. Don't rip me off. And I have thought that a bunch of times. Especially last year, I shared the GoPro footage. I turned on the GoPro and I left it running. As I went after this bull for about the fourth day or fifth day in a row, whatever it was, and I finally got him. And I was miles. I, I, I went forever on foot through the timber, over that side of the mountain, down in the timber, following this thing. Finally got him. Didn't have a clue where I was. I had to leave him there and use the GPS to come back and try to get the quad as close as I could. And anyway, but I remember thinking the whole time, don't you steal my elk, that frickin' bull better be there. When I get there and I was just growling under my breath. Maybe it's in a way, it's a, a weird way of bleeding, but I've, I was vividly growling under my breath and a little, with words out loud, leave my frickin' elk alone. Don't you touch my elk. I earned it. <laughs> you know? But there's nothing you can do about it, right? They're going to take it. They're going to take it. And they have taken the game from humans freaking dozens of times. One of, the mo one of the episodes that stands out the most for me, my memory of hearing and reading, was a group of hunters near Nordegg, Alberta. And they had a, a great big six-point bull hanging whole in their camp from the pole. And they went hunting and they're all coming back. And they all saw this upright, hairy thing literally rip it off of the pole. They said it cocked its head over its shoulder, hold on to its muzzle, and ran with it. <laughs> ran with it. And they all went to the RCM, RCMP station and reported it to. Anyway, and we've all heard how many people have had their... Uh, Perfectly hit white tail buck and taken off, huge blood trail, blood where it laid down, gone. Man, it was a babbling. A babbling. I hopefully some my sharing my feelings of how I feel before I go up to the North Solo. Hopefully, my sharing my honest feelings of my anxiety and apprehension now building up to time to leave and then how I carry myself when I'm hunting. Hopefully that helps somebody out there. Alright? Hopefully that helps a lot of you out there. You do it anyway. Don't be scared. Don't quit. We're all dying. <laughs> We're all going to be dead. Guaranteed. Right? So keep doing it. But it has worked for me to say out loud the second you get on your feet in the woods, in the dark, or whatever time of day it is, just say out loud, I know you're here. And I know you know I'm here. Let's not ruin it for each other. Just leave me alone. I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm just here to get my meat and go home. And that seems to be working for me somewhat so far, except when I'm sharing these stories sometimes and I've had stuff thrown at me, right? Or I felt freaked right out. Anyway, that was a big, long babble. Let's get one more voice heard and then I'm going to get out of here. All right, here we go. Mark, this is red. This is titled... I think I've been tagged. Ugh, that sucks. I think I am too. Hi Steve. I think I've been tagged by something. And yes, you can use my name as Joseph Phelan. I live in Pooler, Georgia. In the past, living in Lowell, Massachusetts, I had an encounter with a spirit that lived in my apartment. I've also seen something silver and floating, still in the sky while living in Fort Mill, South Carolina. Now, but living in Georgia, I've had two experiences. I've already sent you the info of my first. It has lots of info for your eyes only. The second happened only last night, August 18th, 2023. I was woken up at 2.30 a.m. with a loud bang in my house, as if someone or something large whacked my home so hard, I felt the vibration and it woke me out of a dead sleep. I will lie, it scared the ever-living shit out of me. I grabbed my sidearm out of my nightstand and waited to hear anything else, but there was nothing. As soon as it began to get light, I searched the exterior of my home and I found nothing out of place. 
Nothing was broken or damaged. Steve, I truly feel like I've been tagged. This is not something I want in my life. And like I said before, if you find my previous email, it will all begin to make sense. I can honestly say I'm now very uncomfortable living in my new home alone. Thank you for what you do. Sincerely, Joseph Phelan. Joseph, I feel for you, man. I feel for you. I've been in a... I've shared with you guys before. I was in a small cabin with the wall getting beat on by myself in the middle of the night. No lights outside. And it was freaking terrifying. So let's hope it doesn't keep going on. You know, like I said earlier, just a few minutes earlier, um, just plead your case outside openly. Speak it out loud. Tell them to leave you alone. Uh-oh. That'll be the door. Someone's looking for me. I gotta go. Alright. I'll be back tomorrow. I hope I didn't babble too much, you guys. Share my story at howtohunt.com. Oh, and here comes the heroic bear dog. Hello, puppy. What are you doing? You chasing any more bears? She uh, successfully did her job today. I posted a short on the YouTube cha channel. I, I was in the house and I heard this Sarah screaming something outside. She was moving the horses across the road in the other pasture. I'm like, what's going on? You're screaming. That's not normal. Then I heard the dog going ape shit, so I'm running out there. Now all I seen was this great big bear ripping along the road from left to right. Sarah's standing with the horses and the dog right behind the bear going ape shit. And then, uh, obviously I praised her, but then I looked up and that bear was so terrified it got into the timber. I thought it would have kept going, but it didn't. It went straight up a big tree. And it stayed up there all day. <laughs> so she's doing her job. Good girl. She knows her job. So last year, I think the Bears scored 14 against us with 14 chickens. And uh, this year, it's us one, Bear zero. <laughs> Let's go get some dinner. Right, puppy? Let's go. Let's go. You got your first bear, didn't ya? Get him, get him. Get that bear. Get that bear. Get him. Get that bear. <laughs>